Hello everybody, this is your host Nino and today we shall be talking about something which unfortunately is nearly pure unobtainium, although it is an absolutely brilliant device, namely the Digger Rule. Here in the edition Digger Rule 2A, though I can tell you there are others too, including the Digger Rule 2U which has somewhat extended capabilities. But first of all, what is that? Well, it's a roller. Hmm? <laughs> and apparently a labor of love of a genius named Bradley Slattery. And Bradley hails from Australia and has created in this ruler, uh, which is measuring centimeters like every normal person, as well as imperial units as inch. And I don't know, banana lengths or whatever else the barbarians are using. Uh, <laughs> in binary, he has created this thing with an incorporated computer. And I mean a computer as computing was meant to be with diodes and buttons, with blinking lights and pushing. Uh, it would be even... Uh, <laughs> Quite, quite similar to say, uh, quite, quite fitting to say this is very similar to what you may have seen in an Altair 8800 and it operates in an extremely similar fashion. So as opposed to other, you know, calculator uh, rulers, this one actually lets you run through programs in sequence in such a way that they can enter an infinite loop and you have to forcibly stop them. And you program it through an interface, which for those of you who are acquainted with the Altair 8800 may seem rather familiar. So you're having here eight push buttons in order to set individual bits in a byte, very similar to the way you did on the Altair. But this isn't actually an emulation of the Altair 8800, the SWTPC 680 or anything else of that kind or the IMSI 8080. This is an own design. This is inspired by the nature of 1970s computers, but it's not an emulation of any one of them in particular. And I must say it's even purer in that regard. So you set here individual bits, which appear here on those blinking lights. All right. And then uh, you can put anything which you have set here as a binary number into some memory address. Your address line is up here. You're having only 8-bit addressing, that is 255 bytes, but, uh, or 256 bytes if you count the zeroth one, but the topmost ones are reserved for things like the status register and so on. So in reality, you have something like 251 only. All right, so you can put here uh, bytes and you can send them into memory places. And uh, you can navigate around memory uh, with this programming field, like you can say, for instance, that you would like to see what is at some certain memory or location. So you say which location you would like to see and you press go to and there you are and it shows you then the memory location and the datum at that location. In case you would like to store something, like change something, then you just, you know, set the bits, uh, click store and it will be stored at that location. And moreover, you will be advanced to the next memory location. That's a behavior which truly was possible on the original Altair 8800. You can also just run around with previous and next and see what else there is in memory. The whole thing is running on some variation of a PIC microprocessor, where again, that depends on which edition of the Digi rule you are having. Uh, then you're having a run stop, which when you run a normal brief program will run almost momentarily. But of course you can have something which is looping very much and then uh, in particular if it's an undesired loop you might wish to click stop in order to interrupt running and examine how things have been going. Brad has been so kind to also include the facility to load and save programs, which is even better than late 70s computers where you couldn't do that and you just had to, <laughs> you know, if you didn't have anything on an Altea you had to toggle in everything every time, right? So here, however, you have up to eight memory slots and you can load and save programs. 
as I will be demonstrating later, because I have actually saved the program, and of course I will show you how these things are working. Now, there's also an on and off switch, and when you flip the whole thing, you get a summary of the typical, uh, of the available actually, assembler instructions together with their binary representation and their memory length to allow you real pencil and paper assembly programming and binary translation, as well as a sort, uh, short sort of uh, manual as to how you can operate the machine. But that's indeed very intuitive and very nice and, and uh, really not hard to learn at all. So maybe I should just turn it on and show you how you can set in numbers. Okay, so great. Now let's suppose uh, I would like to set the number thousand. Okay, so I'm just lighting here like binary thousand, decimal eight. So I'm lighting here this diode and uh, at the address eight. Okay, I'm, I'm just going to go to address eight. Now you see it just got translated into the address line. So now it's my diode here. I'll set a binary, binary seven, which is one, one, one. Okay. So if I now click here, store, then that's it. I have now advanced into binary nine and I have stored my number at the binary address eight. And if I now go to previous, you can see here, that uh, the address eight contains now the number seven, all right? And, and this is how you program this. This is how you uh, set in numbers, read out numbers. You can go to anywhere in memory you would like to, you know, let me just flip on a few things, then I just press go to. And there, there is nothing yet, of course, at this address, but you see it took it, it got me there. I can go to the next one, I can go to the previous one. And if I'm fed up with uh, anything, I can just go to address zero, right? I can say go to, and there is nothing because at address zero, we haven't saved anything. So as you can see here on the uh, light, the ruler is active, it's just not doing anything. Right, so that is how you uh, read out results and, and store results. In the most simple way, you could use it as a sort of binary counter because I can just press next and advance the address and that way count in binary, you know, like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, and so on. And I could of course also just uh, have gone to a go to uh, zero, you know, and then press previous in order to start a countdown from 255 again in binary. Okay, so in that regard, you can use this ruler really like a 1970s computer. And uh, the question is just what you would like to program into it. Now, I must say, uh, <laughs> Uh, I am perhaps not a too big fan of the instruction set of the Digi Rule 2A, which doesn't even have a multiply and divide instruction, which however is all the more realistic because computers from the late 70s didn't have a multiply or divide instruction either. In particular, not the Intel 8080. So we can say that's even more, more close to how things used to be. This is, uh, as I mentioned already, not an implementation of any particular architecture. It's quite an own thing. And the way I at least perceive it is this is more oriented towards the blinking lights. That is, you know, uh, showing lights, reading uh, light patterns and so on. Whereas, for instance, my own Evo slash Tsvetanka programming languages are more oriented towards letting the user run a computation and then read from memory the results. This one is more made to be cute, and cute it is. And perhaps the very limitation of the instruction set to a, I would say, not unrealistic uh, measure is, is perhaps exactly the challenge. So what useful thing can you do in some 250 bytes without having multiply and divide, and what sort of program can you thereby do there? The digital tool to you adds capabilities to add external terminals and 
uh, God knows what. But I would rather say programming it with pencil and paper, with you know flipping the switches, or in this case, pushing the push buttons and looking at the blinking lights. That's how it's meant to be done. It does contain actually a couple of preset uh, of preset programs which you can just load and then you know like it is moving here and you can just press anything you would like. I'm pressing this and it's something like I don't know, kill the bit or what was it? Uh, I don't know. Like just run and yeah, here it is. So there you're having this old Altair thing where you're trying to kill the bit, but I don't manage to. So the bits just get more and I'm not actually killing it. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how you can do, you know, a lot of things, but uh, uh, you can also overwrite these things with your own programs. And that's what I did uh, with the program I'm going to demonstrate just in a moment. Other than that, I must say, I find the instructions set a little bit strange. It is an accumulator architecture. So one register through which most things are going, but there are some strangely available memory operations, which in, uh, let's say, strict accumulator architectures are not normally possible, like um, doing, doing some bitwise operations directly in memory. Normally you would have to load that into the accumulator, do it in the accumulator, and then uh, put it back in memory. So, Perhaps the eccentricity of this is something you need to get used to, but then again, every microprocessor is something one needs to get used to. And that is all the same, an absolutely marvelous device. So in my program, which I shall present you with in a moment, I am attempting to add two numbers, each of them having three bytes, because that's an absolutely nonsensical measure. Everybody would be adding two or four, but such non-standard things were perhaps typical for the 70s, right? So, see you in a moment. Hope you enjoy. All right, and in this second part of the video, let me show you my assembly program to add two numbers. Well, uh, <laughs> first of all, we are jumping for, uh, to the actual code. Like that's what the first instruction is doing. It is jumping over my, so to say, data segment. And that data segment contains essentially three numbers expressed through a number of bytes. Namely, the first number we would like to add with least significant to most significant byte, numbered one alpha one to alpha three. The second number we want to add being beta one to beta three. And the result, which will be gamma one to gamma three and uh, gamma four will be just holding a potential carry flag, but to that later. So when you're adding the numbers, you normally would be just adding alpha one to beta one, alpha two to beta two, and alpha three to beta three, uh, whereby I'm going to be adding 655,298 to 1,938,418 in order to gain finally 2,593,716 which initially is, uh, is set to zero. And this is just uh, here for checking whether the computation has been correct. And normally we would be progressing that way, except that each one of these segments may trigger a carry flag. That is an overflow of the addition, which you then have to take account of in the next segment you add. Here of particular interest is the each second segment, because in the third, I don't really pay attention to the carry flag telling that, you know, either it fit or didn't fit in the number, like that's my word length, three bytes. Or uh, uh, it, it did fit and then like, good luck. <laughs> the first segment doesn't have a carry because there is no segment before it, but the second segment is not just one addition, but essentially it's two additions because each of uh, you, you have to add a number to the carry and then the result to the other number, okay? So that's what we will be progressing and doing. And in the uh, further things, I'll be explaining to you how I did that. And you will realize that this is indeed an accumulator architecture where 
most of what you're doing is just moving things in and out of the uh, one register which is serving as accumulator and doing things with a RAM to it. And given that you're having only 256 memory locations, this sort of reduced instruction set, not unlike the, let's say, 6502 or something like that, is actually quite quickly eating up a lot of memory. So I'm not saying this is a great program, I'm just saying that was my approach. And I'll be explaining here how you can do that. So we begin simple. We add the least significant bytes and that's super straightforward because there's no carry. We copy from RAM into the accumulator the least significant number of alpha one, uh, of, of alpha, like the alpha one byte. To that, we add beta one, which is the least significant byte of the other number. And that gives us the result inside the accumulator which we then, with this operation, copy AR, the opposite of RA, we are storing the accumulator into the least significant byte of the result. Okay, so alpha 1 plus beta 1 gives us gamma 1. However, that may have already triggered a carry, and now we need to check for that. First of all, on into the memory location gamma 2, like the next byte in the result, which will now temporarily hold the caddy, we are setting a zero. And that zero, we are shifting through the caddy flag, giving it thereby a chance to become a one. So gamma two, like the next segment, the next significant segment of the result, is now either a zero if these two added up without a caddy, or a one if there was a caddy, which then in the next edition needs to be taken into account. So that's great, uh, <laughs> but now that we did that and in Gamma 2 we may be having a, a, a carry, we are moving that variable into the accumulator from the RAM location where we shifted it. So here you can actually see that Brad had a bit of a really own processor architecture because this sort of operation like shifting things around is normally something you would exactly do in the register and not actually in memory but we did it in memory and now have to put it into the register okay fine next next is that i just um, skipped a couple of steps in my assembly program so i scribbled them to the side and created an absolute mess which is not exceptional neither for assembly nor to the way i enjoy doing things so i'll just have to guide you through it like virgil guided dante through hell and it is nothing less than that so we are having now the carry in the accumulator we are adding from ram into the accumulator the next significant byte of the first number adding it to the potential carry. All right. And uh, that's great. So we are having here carry plus second segment of first number. And we are storing that uh, as an intermediate result in the second byte of the result. Okay. That's great, but here it may have triggered another carry. Like if, if the one was a carry of one and the other thing being the binary equivalent of 9999 or like 1111 binary, then adding the carry to it will itself trigger one further carry, okay? So we need to store the potential carry from adding our previous carry to the first number and we do that in gamma 4 this is this uh, result segment of gamma which we actually don't use to look at it's just a carrier carry carrier <laughs> okay so so we again put here a zero into gamma 4 and we rotate it now again through the carry and see whether that becomes one or zero like uh, it, it, it becomes one of those uh, two things so now that uh, gamma 4 contains our possible carry from this addition, we proceed to copy back from RAM into the accumulator our intermediate result of having added the carry with the second segment of the first number. 
Having done that in the accumulator, we add to that, now finally, the second segment of the second number, which in turn may once again have triggered a carry, because you see both of these additions can trigger a carry, either alpha 2 plus the carry, or uh, this thing plus the carry and beta 2. Both of these can have triggered a carry flag, which we dutifully will check, will have to check too. But first of all, we are copying now this intermediate result of having added uh, beta 2 to this uh, temporary value before, now into the final value of the gamma 2 segment of the like second byte of the result. So now we have the second byte of the result, but we need to take to pay attention uh, was there a carry in the second edition. Again, we're putting a zero, this time into gamma three. And again, we're shifting now gamma three through the carry, which will make gamma three uh, either, a, either a one if there was a carry or letting it remain a zero if there was no carry. Okay, so now we're having two possible carries. One is in gamma 3 from our most recent addition, and one is in gamma 4 from having added alpha 2 to the uh, first carry from alpha 1 plus beta 1. Okay, so these two are the possible carries. And therefore, we copy gamma 3, like our one possible carry, into the accumulator again, and we OR it with gamma 4. And that means that either, like bitwise OR, okay, that means that uh, and the result is stored again in the accumulator, and that means if either gamma 3 or gamma 4 contained a carry, then that carry will now be in the accumulator, and can be then used in order to finalize our addition, where we simply and bluntly add to the accumulator the most significant byte of the first number, right, and the most significant byte of the second number, giving us gamma 3, where we save the accumulator, that is the result of the addition into gamma 3, and I just didn't have the nerve to check further for carries, and I didn't care whether that produces a carry, and I said, okay, that's it for that word length, that's the addition of one 3-byte number and another 3-byte number, okay? So, and then we halt the whole thing. So that's actually quite a good number of instructions for an essentially rather simplistic process of adding uh, to, to a little bit bigger numbers than 255. And now let's demonstrate it. So, hope you uh, could sort of follow the explanation of what we're going to do. It's going to be very unspectacular when we look at it. But first we turn on the roller and there is our little animation. Here is the run and stop light. We are at stop because we aren't doing anything in particular. Then we're pressing load and holding that. And you see here this ping pong blinking light, which is telling us that it is ready to load a program. And we're pressing D7 in order to get the uh, program out of memory and into executable space, which I just showed to you. Okay, it lit up. And this 11100 is in fact the jump instruction. If, if I now press next, you'll see the 1100, which is the binary 12. So that was the jump to 12. And then you're seeing here the value of alpha 1, uh, the value of alpha 2, and the most significant bit, uh, byte alpha 3. Then this is the second number, which is its least significant byte, next most significant byte, and most significant byte, as well as gamma uh, 1, gamma 2, gamma 3, and gamma 4, the result space, which is not yet filled. Okay, and uh, now you see I progressed here a little bit further and I say no, no, I want to go back to uh, 0, 0, 0, 0 and thereby uh, to go to the beginning of the program and execute it from there. And now I'll just press run stop and in a fraction of a second everything will be over. Ta-da! You could see here how the address light changed. 
So now we have our result. And our result is stored from memory position 8 on, which is a binary thousand. Okay, so I set here 1, 0, 0, 0. And then I say go to. And that indeed gives us here as a least significant byte. Let me just get the ruler and the expected result. It's giving us 1, 0, 1, 1. 0, 1, 0, 0. This is exactly what is shown here. If I go to the next one, then I'm getting 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1. Now, <laughs> I admit that's not entirely random. I actually wanted that uh, I get here due to carry operations better to exactly, and I did. So that's also correct. And gamma 3 should be 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1. So one zero zero one one one. We got our expected result of two million five hundred ninety three thousand seven hundred and sixteen. So that's how you can program that thing with pencil and paper. It's absolutely possible. I can show you even the first draft of this thing. Uh, <laughs> so you see, there there was a lot of changing of of the mind and correcting and doing whatnot. So, yeah, you, you can, in fact, use that as a sort of assembly learning device. And uh, due to the very constrained space, I would actually say this is even very suitable for that purpose, because uh, you don't have who knows what uh, gigabytes, megabytes, or even kilobytes of RAM where you can get lost, but everything is just straight in front of your nose and you can handle things uh, in the most original way, uh, the way computers were meant to be programmed, namely through blinking lights. And with that, thank you for joining today. Hope to greet you here soon again. From me, have a great day and goodbye.